So thank you all for joining us. My name is Langston Clark and I am the host and founder of Entrepreneurial Appetite's Black Book Discussions. And Entrepreneurial Appetite is a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism and supporting black businesses. And um, today we are doing a special fundraiser for the black ex-students of Texas in San Antonio. Best San Antonio is basically the black alumni group from UT Austin who serve as um, just ambassadors for the university. We try to recruit students, we try to support students. Uh, typically uh, during this week, which is Dream Week, which I'll explain a little bit about later on, we do um, a session for black students here in San Antonio telling them about the university or just how to navigate college in general. And since you all know COVID-19 has been here, um, it's kind of like changed up our plans a little bit. So this is our way to sort of um, present something to the community and uh, do something of benefit as we look to expand our programming here once COVID is over. And so also want to take the opportunity to introduce uh, Deborah Omawale, who's going to tell us a little bit about Dream Week, which some of you is how some of you found out about uh, this event, and um, I'll let her talk about that now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is our uh, kickoff to Dream Week. We're so excited that you're here. Dream Week is going into the ninth year, founded by Shokare Nakpodia, who is the owner of the Mighty Group. This year's theme is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because of the um, pandemic, if you may recall, Dream Week last year had over 200 events. Well, we limited the events this year to right around 100 events. So many of them are virtual, but we promise if you have not had a chance to look at the website dreamweek.org, you'll see some amazing events. And, and the events that are going to be in person will be safe and uh, socially distanced appropriately. I am the CEO Director of the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. And I would like to say that we are having a, an in-person event that is outdoors. We will explore the East View Cemetery, which is a historic cemetery here in San Antonio. It will be about an hour tour with groups of nine. Why, are there, why is there nine? Because the 10th person is the docent. And, um, like I said, about an hour, and we will explore some African-American icons here in San Antonio, like Myra Hemings and Hattie Briscoe and Claude Black Sr., a number of people that are buried at the cemetery. So be on the lookout. A lot of your favorite events are going to be back in person, like the African Market Place, which will be at Brick next Saturday. Just some really good stuff. We have a speaker series that will uh, talk about our journey as African Americans from Africa and also indigenous people. So make sure you go to dreamweek.org. Dream Week officially starts January 14th and it ends on January 24th. And also check out SACAM's website, sacam.org. Thank you so much Langston for allowing uh, me to be here and you all are in for a treat this evening. Thank you, Deborah. Um, next, I want to introduce uh, a long, a long time uh, book club member of Entrepreneurial Appetites Black Book Discussions. What we try to do is highlight at least one black business uh, each time we do these discussions. And so I want to introduce you all to Dominique Miles. Thank you so much, Langston. Hello, everybody. My name is Dominique Miles. My family and I opened a state farm agency, and we're going on our third year this year. A lot of success, a lot of fun, a lot of energy at this office. So if you are looking for an insurance agent that truly has your back, truly will explain to you all the ins and outs of the insurance industry, we are that team for you. In fact, today, if anybody is interested, I'd like to send you a calendar. We have the 2021 calendars in, and they turned out fabulous. A lot of beautiful artwork in here each month. So if you want to um, put your email inside the chat, I'll be happy to send you guys a calendar. And just more importantly, I'm just so 
proud and happy to be a part of San Antonio and be a part of this book club here today. And just want to definitely reach out and help any way we can. The website for my agency is Dominique, excuse me, is Dom, D-O-M, at relyonmiles.com. And I also put that in the group chat as well. Today's book was fabulous. Thank you so much, doctor. I, I look forward to listening to you today and, and learning even more about how you came up with the book. So thank you so much, Langston, for having me. And I look forward to many, many more um, participations, okay? Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. So, so now we're gonna, um, we're gonna get into our, our discussion. And uh, first, I, I wanna uh, introduce our panelists for the day. We have uh, Dr. Dinah Rainey Berry, who is the first uh, black, black and woman chair of the Department of History at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a fantastic scholar. She's a fantastic person. Also, we have Dr. Callie Nicole Gross, who is a professor of history at Emory University. And she is the Creative Productions Director of the Association of Black Women Historians. I got all that right. Um, and so I just really appreciate both of them. We, we sometimes get, um, get caught up in like uh, how great a scholars uh, Black folk are once they reach this, the level that these two women have. And they are fantastic scholars. Um, but just knowing Dr. Berry personally and just looking up Dr. Gross's background and her work that she does um, with Black folk who are incarcerated, there's something I appreciate about both of them is that they're, they're excellent in their everydayness too. And so I think you all will get some of that here today in the conversation. Also want to introduce to everyone, uh, someone who was like at the very first book club meeting we had maybe two years ago, um, a good friend of mine, Sierra Murphy, and she is going to be our moderator uh, for today, has some outstanding questions lined up. And so after we've done like a good discussion for about mm, 30, 40 minutes, uh, what I will do is I'll start taking in questions from the audience. And if you all could type those in the Q&A, uh, that would be great. And then once we transition to that part, we'll also use the raise your hand function. And then we'll see if we can call on some of you to ask your questions uh, out loud. So without further ado, uh, Sierra, just kick us off and uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Langston. Appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say that uh, while I was reading the book, um, you know, despite like the various uh, books that I've read by F African-American authors about black history. Um, it was insightful to find information that um, I haven't heard of before. And I'll get to some of that in the, in the questions. Um, but I did find myself having to like take a lot of breaks um, because the material is pretty heavy. Um, and it's just amazing that like, even though, uh, you know, African-Americans have gone through so many uh, trials and, uh, you know, tribulations that We've been able we've been able to to, to conquer um, you know all type of uh, difficulties, um, but even just listening to it, I could um, you know feel saddened or um, you know get very angry in the, in the moment while reading some of the material. Um, you know, it's incredible to kind of see uh, a lot of things that have evolved from uh, African Americans. So. Anyways, thank you for listening to my ramble. I'm gonna get into the questions, if you don't mind. Um, so to kind of start us off, like what inspired, um, this goes to either of you, what inspired um, you guys to write the book uh, and like what was the process for writing it? Most importantly, like how did you find a lot of this information? Um, you know, this is, isn't stuff that gets taught in like middle school or elementary school or high school. Um, so I'm in interested as to how you got a lot of this information You want to go first, Dr. Gross? Uh, sure. So first of all, thank you all so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, and thank you so much, Langston, for the great introduction. I just want to make one thing. I'm a professor of African American Studies at Emory. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. I think, I think somebody said history. In any event, we actually were approached by an editor at Beacon. And this was when we were both faculty at UT Austin. Um, but it was a really fortuitous meeting because we had been thinking a lot and talking about the fact that there wasn't a newer kind of history survey about um, 
Black women in the United States, we have been, you know, I think Diana, you always phrase it beautifully, been standing on the shoulders of giants. We're using works like Paula Ginning's book um, or the work of Darlene Clark Hine and Kathleen Thompson. But those works at that point were all, I think almost 20 years old. And so, you know, it was kind of like this exciting moment to think about writing a history for Black women that would serve the needs of readers in the 21st century. Um, and in terms of source material, we really used, you know, anything and everything, primary research. We also, the field of Black women's history has grown exponentially just by leaps and bounds. So they also took the book as an opportunity to highlight the work of other sister scholars who have just done a lot of cutting edge research we also tried to use sources that were readily available to help pique folks' interest. Um, and so that people can follow up and, and check out these sources for themselves. Um, so I think that's sort of, and I don't know, Diane, if you wanted to add anything to that. Oh, not a whole lot. I just wanted to echo um, my appreciation for the invitation. And um, both of us are really happy to be here. Um, wish we could be there in, in person, but we're happy to have this conversation. And I think it's a really timely conversation given everything that's happened even this week alone and what's gonna happen on the 20th of January when we, um, when the, our government inaugurates the first woman of African descent as, as the Vice President of the United States. So I think the history is timely. Um, Dr. Gross and I um, spent a lot of time, as she was saying, talking back and forth about what we wanted to say, who we should cover in the book, how we should write it. Um, we both were working really hard in the archives to make sure we were telling unique stories. And midway into working on the book, we had done such a great job of really trying to highlight women that maybe people wouldn't have ever heard of, that when we shared the book with colleagues and a group of sister scholars um, at a workshop at Rutgers, um, the first thing that they said to us was that we needed to put some more of the more familiar names in the book as, um, Sort of anchors to understand like who are the other women that were in the peer group of Harriet Tubman who were who were the women that were in the peer group of Fannie Lou Hamer who were some of the other women that preceded um, Rosa Parks and so that really changed the way we we structured the book midway and that workshop was um, one of the best moments of our um, of our academic careers and just of our of our process in writing the book. Yeah, it really, it really was this incredible moment. You know, we were, we knew that we wanted the book to, so our challenge was to write a book that would be readily available and accessible to a wide readership. And we also wanted to make it ex expansive, right? To write a book where any black woman could pick it up and learn something about themselves or recognize someone in their family or something along that line, right? Um, but at the same time, we, it needed to be sort of a, a kind of a brief survey, right? It was meant to be sort of an introduction. And so we were really wrestling with a lot. And we finally decided that we, we needed to sort of sit with other sister scholars and just kind of get input, work more collectively. Um, and that's in the vein of Black women's history, quite frankly. I mean, you know, Black women are incredible organizers and really know how to network. So we had this workshop where 10 other scholars were just incredibly generous and just read through everything we had and, and spent a day hashing it out. What, what kind of worked, what didn't, what we had, what we needed to add, what we needed to let go of. Um, it was a really powerful experience. And I agree to echo Dinah, it was probably one of the the most incredible professional experiences that I've had, um, certainly to date. Awesome. Well, um, thank you both for, for answering that. Um, I'd say that one of the most interesting aspects of the book, uh, or at least something that I learned, um, were about the stories of Black women who were slaveholders. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. I. Um... That was a difficult part, and I think we even have a paragraph in there where we say this is a difficult history to discuss. And it was awkward, it was awkward for us, and even I think even the copy editor at the press was like, are you sure you want to say this? Um, but it was, we were trying to find a way, 
we felt like we could not talk about it um, because it gets um, it gets mistaught in in classrooms. Whenever people find out that black people enslaved other black people, it's like oh, there's no reason for for us to complain about slavery, um, or they misunderstand what that system looked like. And we really wanted to find a way to to profile a few enslavers to show what it means for someone to try to purchase their family and what that looked like um, as a way to live in pseudo slavery, but then also black women who chose to be in relationships um, with white men that they could then live in a space um, where they were able to raise their children, have their children become educated. And we, we were just trying to, to leave room for that, but also put it in context so that people don't take that and use that or misuse that in the way, um, in the way they taught it. So we felt like it was our duty to try to be responsible about telling that history and about um, really showing that black women that did own other enslaved people or enslaved other enslaved other black folks um, didn't have the level of power. I think we spent a lot of time with language so they could they could hold people, but they really didn't have the power of a system behind them because of their African ancestry. And so we wanted to make that point very clear. And I, I'm not sure it came across, but we hope it did. Well, thank you. Um, we also uh, kind of talked about um, the importance of like mental health, uh, especially in the black community right now and it being a big topic within like you know, media. Um, I noticed early in the book, there were themes of like suicide and self-harm um, in terms of like defiance. Um, what kind of inspired that, uh, that portion um, uh, within the text? So um, I'll start off first. Um, in that in that space, we saw black women taking ownership of what they knew was valued about them, and that was their bodies. And in a space where they had little control, um, they could then do things like make themselves less valuable in a market setting, um, so that then they wouldn't be sold. So they could stay with on a particular estate with their relatives or or a space that was familiar to them. Where they had loved ones and so we wanted to show that as a choice and also some some people looked at taking their own lives as a way to go to a better place um, go to an afterlife in a space that was devoid of slavery that didn't have slavery and so um, even though it's it's difficult to write about um, and not the most uplifting writing um, it was a part of our experience and our goal was to always tell the truth and to tell the truth about our history and about the way in which people responded to different aspects of our history at different moments. And I would just sort of add that it is, again, also a part of trying to also represent Black women's experiences in a diverse way. So not just presenting the most heroic kinds of stories or themes that typically dominate, I think, mainstream or popular kinds of studies but to really offer a nuanced, layered history um, that allows Black women to be fully human, right? And to have to leave space for, for human frailty. Oh, thank you, appreciate it. Um, so the next question is, um, I also noticed that there were uh, significant themes of Black queer and trans women uh, throughout the book. Um, could you kind of touch on the importance of talking about um, you know, the LGBTQ community um, in terms of being a Black person, a Black woman? Uh, sure, absolutely. I mean, that was definitely, again, to just build on what I said before, it was really important to us to have an expansive and representative history, right? So all kinds of Black women um, needed to be included. And the Black queer experience was certainly a central aspect of that. And what we really tried to do was to demonstrate that the history, right? So that this isn't something that just shows up in chapter 10, where we get into more of the present, right? But that there, in all these spaces, we tease out where you have Black women who you know, were in same-sex relationships in the antebellum era where we have Black women who today we would identify as transgender 
um, she considered herself of double sex, but this is, you know, shortly after reconstruction, wanting to tell those stories and map those experiences, um, both to be representative, but also in the case of Frances Thompson to show the pivotal role that they played in Black women's history. Um, you know, just for, for folks who maybe haven't read the book, Frances Thompson was um, at born, well, she identified as female and had been assaulted during the Memphis riots shortly after the Civil War and was one of the five women who went on to bravely testify that they had been assaulted by these white men during a race riot and to say that she did not consent. Um, but that, that testimony made her sort of persona non grata. And so she was harassed routinely by police and there were these allegations that she was not in fact a woman, but a man. She was ultimately arrested and subjected to a series of invasive examinations and then criminalized because they found her sex to be male, even though she identified as being of double sex and had chosen to live as a woman. So she played this pivotal role in, in Black women's history. Um, and it was just, you know, something that we had to include. I think that was also inspired um, to, as Dr. Gross was saying, to have a really inclusive history. Um, we've also, at least for scholars of slavery, have been trying to get to that space in enslavement to identify um, queer people during slavery, to identify um, different types of relationships. And it's been hard, um, but we've been, we've been trying to identify that in, in the scholarship. And I think um, one way for us to do that is was to make sure that we show that there are groups of people um, throughout every time period, as Dr. Gross said, and we were trying to find ways to make sure we incorporated that in the book. Well, thank you. Um, definitely important. Um, going to the next question, could you tell us a little bit more about the decision to include Alice Coachman, uh, considering that Black women athletes uh, don't get recognized or celebrated in the same way as Black men? Uh, oh, okay, sure. I thought I was muted. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you you kind of answered our question. That that was a part of it. it. Was just to highlight Black women's athleticism and to show too that not only were they you know natural born sort of athletes. I mean, this was a passion that she had and, and nurtured and cultivated as a part of who she was, but also that she went on to you know win this Olympic gold medal and she broke barriers and that she was aware of the role that she was playing in history. I mean, I think, I don't know, Dinah, you, I don't know if you want to speak to this too. One of the things that I personally learned and I remain awed by about Black women throughout various moments in time, even our present, is how often they work to combat sort of racism and discrimination and all these challenges in part just so they can live and be who they want to be cleave out this space for themselves but also at the same time they remain really mindful of the role that they play for the race for black womanhood more broadly um i'm just in awe of that and alice kosher was a perfect example of someone who you know wanted to run and had this incredible I'm sorry, not to run. She wanted. She was an athlete. She, you know, she had this incredible athleticism and wanted to exercise. She had to confront these barriers around race and gender, but she knew that she needed to be successful because, as she says it, if she failed, there wouldn't be a space for any other black woman to come behind her. It's just it shows, um, and I think it also sets the stage for the activism that we're seeing today among um, black women athletes. So there's, a, there's a history behind black women stepping out and going and traveling to other countries and, and participating in Olympic games um, when uh, in the heat, in the height of segregation, um, where black people were having to go through different entrances, not allowed to stay at the, stay at the same hotels. Um, I, think it, I think it shows the foundation that, that the women that are coming up today, um, it shows a foundation that they are coming from. Um, and and the, the only difference that, that I think we see is that a lot of the activism um, with someone like an Alice Coachman is much more individual. Like, you know, you, you see Alice Coachman, there are people later on like Wilma Rudolph and the Tiger Bells, um, Wyoming Matthias and other, uh, other black women track athletes. Um, 
that were doing this individual, but now you're seeing team sports protesting. I mean, even today, um, and they're leading protest movements for Black Lives Matter. Um, I think there's a foundation among individuals as we go back in history to you know the, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And so I just, I think that was really important for us to show as well. Thank you. Um, going to the next question. Um, how can we use the book, um, or I'm sorry, how can the book be used to reconcile differences throughout um, the African dysphoria? It's an interesting question. So, and I want to make sure I understand, when you say reconcile, what, what do you mean? So, um, I just know, like, at least from my experience, um, you know, being an African-American uh, descendant of slavery versus like a buddy of mine who's from Nigeria. I'm sorry, um, her parents are from Nigeria, but she's from, um, she's born in California. Uh, so, you know, she's considered, she considers herself to be Ni Nigerian. And there's kind of this um, um, like different experiences amongst African-American descendants of slaves. And then um, people that have like I guess you could say direct lineage from Africa where they're able to embody, you know, um, their, their culture, whereas I'm sure that I have roots from Nigeria as well, or at least part of Western Africa, but I'm not able to embody um, the culture in the same way. And so how can we create like more cohesion between um, both communities? Um, for instance, I think one, one example will be, um, what's her name? Um, a lady that played Harriet Tubman um recently oh i'm, yeah. I'm i know so, i'm yeah. blanking on her name yeah. i can't remember her name but i know who you're, we know who you're talking about is it olivia <laughs> something you guys gonna make me look it up <laughs> i know I can, uh, yes cynthia arrivo that's er, 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 arrivo yes that's it okay. yeah yeah um, well i remember one like a discussion point about why couldn't they get an african-american woman to play a Harriet Tubman, why did they have to get this British lady? I know that there's some other controversy, but I remember that being kind of a question and thinking like, okay, sure. I could see how um, it'd be nice, but uh, like what's also the, the issue with it at the same time? So that's kind of what I meant. It is kind of a layered question. Um, thank you. Okay, so I, all right, so I think I have a better sense of what, of what you're saying. Um, I think one of the ways that I see the book as being helpful is just to educate some of these communities about the experience. So to demonstrate that, that there is this, not only this sort of this connection, a distant connection, but also to demonstrate all the ways that Black folks in the U.S. have retained and also cultivated and adapted a new kind of culture and practice that has served to to be a model for, I think, a lot of Black folks throughout the diaspora about how to resist, resist white supremacy in really effective ways. Um, you know, but for Haiti, right, who sort of threw off, you know, <laughs> the yokes of oppression, um, you know, African Americans have reshape the nation, Black women. I mean, that's what the whole part of the book is about, too, is that Black women, you know, have pushed back and basically helped make America a truer version of what it pretends to be. And so I think folks educating themselves about that experience can help to, I think, break down some of the barriers, perhaps, um, and also some of the animosity. Although the case with, with um, that particular actress is also because she had said disparaging things about African American history and culture. So that, that was also a, a part of the resentment. So hopefully reading this book would maybe help her have a better understanding about the folks that she initially maybe spoke about in unkind ways. I would just add that I think there's, there's sometimes judgment um, of African Americans um, because we lived in slavery for you know 246 years, but I, is, if if people understood and knew about that history and understood how that oppression was able to sustain itself for so long, um, and that that 
people of African descent that became African American did fight back at every single stage from the moment they were captured in their communities in, in parts of West and Central uh, Africa, from the moment they were put on ships, um, the, from the moment they were taken off the ships. And we have evidence of that. So I think sometimes the tension that we see is a judgment on a superior inferior, inferiority complex. And I think that that doesn't really do any of us uh, service at all. And hopefully when you understand the histories of all of these regions, um, that will come away and, and, and be a little bit more uh, respectful of the, the larger diaspora. And then there's one other piece I would just throw in really quickly, which is also to, in thinking about that diaspora, some of these other ways, the other thing that we talk about are how certain folks also join the population and become a part of Black women's history in the U.S. So if we think about, you talk about like Claudia Jones, who emigrated to the U.S. from Trinidad, you know, as a fairly young person and, you know, fought until she was deported um, from the country, um, you know, as a member of the, you know, the Communist Party, but even other folks who people may not be aware of, you know, everyone, you know, lauds Malcolm X, um, you know, it's helpful to know that his mother was actually from Grenada. So, you know, trying to, to also stretch out and complicate kind of how we talk about diaspora. Um, and of course, we end the book with, you know, Patrice Okumu, who, you know, scaled Lady Liberty in defense of children in cages at the border. So I'm, I think that there are ways that we engaged diaspora that are beginning to also help along helping those dialogues. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the struggles of the woman within the book that kind of parallel to black women and present day? Um, yeah, that's where I'll stop the question. I, I mean, I think the woman we opened the book with, um, Isabel de Alvera, um, I mean, she opens, we open with her, um, you know, asking to go on an expedition to what now is contemporary New Mexico. Um, and she says that she is neither bound by marriage or slavery. So she's a free woman of African descent and she knows that people will be disturbed by her presence. Um, and at the end of her testimony where she had to go get this piece of paper to allow her to travel, um, she says, I demand justice. And I think for Dr. Gross and I, when we, um, decided to put her narrative or story in there, we were thinking about, you know, the fact that black women today are still demanding justice and that we came to this country demanding justice and we're still demanding it. And I think one of the, one of the key takeaways for, for us who write about uh, black women's history is that we we're seeing black women across every time period in American history. Um, they're often involved in multiple, um, multiple um, causes. They're not just, you know, a one-stop shop in terms of like focusing on one cause. Most black women are, were suffragettes. They were also abolitionists. You know, they were also in the, in the post-slavery era, they were fighting for desegregation and also anti-lynching campaigns. So they were often doing multiple things. And I think that was something that we tried to stress and we see that still happening today as well. I also think there are parallels, just to, to piggyback on what Dr. Barry just said. We also see real continuity in terms of Black women's role in the political process. So, you know, Stacey Abrams, right, the Black Voters Matter, like these sisters, they have a real history, um, you know, from as, as Dr. Barry mentioned, Black women who are suffragists, but they also organized in groups also. So Black women in 1924, um, just after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, they actually formed their own political group, right? They were, you know, the National League of Republican Colored Women, right? They organized, they led voter registration drives in places where people were able to vote. They tried to um, agitate for the uh, Blacks in the South to be able to exercise their right in spite of um, racist tyranny and segregation. And they tried to put demands on politicians. They recognized that Black people and Black women could be this important voting bloc. 
for the Republican Party, which was still at that time the party of Lincoln. Um, <laughs> for many folks' minds, not the GOP that we know today. Um, but, uh, and, and at the same time, they registered their discontent when they realized that their needs were not being met and they disbanded that group and began to switch party affiliation. So they have this legacy of organizing politically, of engaging the process, of taking candidates into churches and fundraising and campaigning. All of that has a history. Um, thank you. So uh, my final question here, um, just kind of talk about the, the recent events that have taken place on the Capitol. Um, I was actually reading a couple of articles uh, that were talking about um, some of the protesters, the rioters that were there that had actually died, um, like the lady climbing through the window and she got shot and um, one lady got trampled to death um, and uh, a police officer being, um, being um, killed by a fire extinguisher. He was um, by one of the by one of the writers, and it just kind of made me kind of reflect back at like the extent and brutality of like white supremacist violence. And you know, after listening again to um, the story of Emmett Till and how you guys were going into detail about um, you know what his body had had went through, um, I just kind of wonder like what. Um, like, what is it going to take for, for, I mean, not obviously just us, but uh, United States to kind of come to terms with, with white supremacy violence and, and, you know, have them notice that it affects everybody, that even people within their own community. Um, That's a great question. I mean, I, I think Dr. Gross and I had, had a chance to like talk one-on-one -on -one this week, um, but um, I know for me, it's been, hard to process although it's very familiar it's nothing like for me i'm not surprised i was i wasn't surprised that we can go back through several moments in history where we see this this um this level of of activism i mean we don't have to go that far we can go to charlottesville it was at 2017 where we saw something similar to this right um although it wasn't our nation's capital um th these are some of the same um groups that were that were um, marching at U UVA's campus, and then in Charlottesville downtown, where another woman was killed as a result of that. Um, I think what you, what I what I always say is is that that has never left our culture. That has never left our community. These are grandsons, great grandsons of some of the same people that um, advocated for um, white supremacy in the post slavery era. Um, that they have not left. It's not like they're gone. We haven't we haven't healed from from that history, um, and there's still a mindset of. Um, I mean, even if you looked, sorry, I'm, in, I'm interrupting myself. But even if you looked at some of the things that they were saying, like I, I saw a lot of the footage like visually, but then to to actually hear the audio footage of some of the things that were being said, like this is our country, as if it's not ours. And I think I said something about that earlier in the week. It's like as if black people. Um, don't have a right to be here, haven't done a lot of the labor to allow us to be here, um, and have supported this nation, fought in almost, fought in every war. Um, and so I think that right there is missed um, in these kinds of conversations. And, what is, and to answer your question, what's going to happen, when, when will it go away, I think we have to first acknowledge it, that it's here. And I'm, we're starting to see some people acknowledge it um, this week, but I'm not sure um, I think there was a video and a, and, a, and a montage put out today by the New York Times, and it was saying like, this is not who we are. They were sort of playing on that. And the, the three um, authors of this video montage were saying, but yeah, actually it is who we are. Um, it is absolutely who we are. This is absolutely the kinds of responses that people have had when they didn't win, their party didn't win the election. This is absolutely, I mean, to have nooses hanging, uh, you know, the noose stand out there, Actually, during Jim Crow era, Black people were actually being lynched at that time. Um, so I think that this has always been a part of our culture. And until we start telling the truth about our history and putting that in the books, um, and that you will have difficult passages that you're going to have to read, 
um, I think that's the starting point. And that's where I'd like us to start, is to tell the truth about who we are and where we've been. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I don't have too much more to add. I do think this myth about this isn't who we are is just not serving us well uh, at all. And it just causes everyone to have to go back and, you know, restate this, you know, <laughs> go through and cut this myth again. Um, I also think that we need to, we have to do better about just confronting it head on and finding better language to begin to really address and talk about it. One of the things that I was struck by and just sort of watching the footage also, and this might be taking us too far afield, so I apologize, um, is that they kept asking this question, well, what do you, you know, what do you think would, what would have happened if the, you know, if these were the Black Lives Matter protests, or why do you think there are these disparities, or what is it? It's like, we all know why that is, right? Like, what are we wasting time reinventing this wheel for? We, everyone knows why it was disparate treatment. Come on, you know? And so at this point, it's sort of like, what, what are we going to do about that? Who's going to be accountable for it? Right. I know one person resigned. It's clear that some of those officers were in full agreement with some of these folks. Are those folks going to be held accountable? Can we parlay that into ongoing reforms in policing now that you have seen with your own eyes everything that everyone has been talking about for the last century with respect to racism and policing and criminal justice? You know, it's just, it's, it's enough. So I definitely feel like we have to also just let's, we know what it is now, right? We don't need to kind of revisit. I mean, definitely we have to teach this history to get folks up to speed, but no one is in denial about racism or white supremacy or, you know, white privilege at this point. It was on full display. So the conversation, I think, that is the other piece I'm personally waiting for. I don't want to start again back here when everything, you know, we're at this point in the dialogue now. So definitely that, I think that is something that has to change. Um, and then also that, again, there needs to be real consequences. Everyone's talking, you know, already the rhetoric has moved toward healing. I'm hearing healing a lot, but I haven't heard a whole lot about consequences or accountability yet. And so, you know, we can't have that, right? We can't have that sort of healing without people being accountable and having consequences, right? So that, those are sort of my thoughts, just where I'm at with it at this moment. Okay, um, so I thank you both for your time. Um, um, I do wanna turn the table back to Langston. I think you might have additional questions perhaps. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to, thank you, Sierra. Um, we're going to get into the Q&A. And so the way we're going to do this again is like, as I said at the beginning, uh, for those of you who weren't here, we're going to use the Q&A function in the chat. Um, and then some of you emailed me some questions as well. So if we get to those, we'll ask some. And then some folks, uh, we may allow to ask their questions uh, verbally. And if you want to do that, raise your hand and I will make it um, accessible for you to be able to uh, speak and ask your questions of today's guests. I wanna start with a question from Jada Andrew Sullivan. So I think she was like the first person to type something in the chat. And so she's wondering how often will um, an updating of the history be? And will there be a website or some other platform uh, that people can use to access uh, this black women's history of the United States? Because we know that it is an ongoing, an ongoing history, so. Yeah, that's a great question. We've actually had that question a, a lot of about a lot of spaces where we've talked and we actually were thinking about doing a website. Um, we are coming out with the paperback version and we did make some changes to the epilogue um, just because of events of 2020. Um, we also have a young adult version of the book coming out so that that would get in the hands of K through 12. Um, and we know that there's a we did a conference last year at the uh, in the summer. Um, a virtual conference at the University of Missouri. Um, they have an Institute for Black Studies there. And we did a talk at that particular um, group. And we, we were interacting with a number of K through 12 educators who had already used the book even before we made it into a young adult version. So I think those are two different spaces. Um, I, I could see, I mean, I, I feel like now so much has happened in the last year 
that there are there are things that we would add a change and update um, but this is this this writing of black women's history sort of a general reader on black women's history as dr gross said at the beginning has happened every few you know years and we knew that there wasn't one for our generation um and so we that's one of the reasons why we wrote it um and we tried to write it where we were in, in, in encompassing a number of stories across the whole arc of the history i don't know if you want to add any more to that dr gross no, I mean, I think you you pretty much said it all, so I'm I'm good with that. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Thank you all again, and thank you for the question, Jada. Um, I, I have a question, um, um, but I'm just wondering, is there is there a space for you, maybe, or someone else to write like a comprehensive history of Black women, of Black women's history in sport? Because, I mean, we hear about the men, we hear about, um, uh you know the uh the meeting the brothers had when when muhammad ali was stripped of his title all the things that we see lebron and them doing now but what does this history look like specific to black women in sports so so thanks for this question well first of all, i want to say that you know this so this was definitely a a, a joint endeavor so Don and i wrote wrote the book together and and while we have different areas of expertise and speciality we definitely shared and weighed in back and forth so i will invite you also to weigh in dinah um but in terms of i definitely think there are some works out about specific black women athletes and and those have have kind of touched on longer histories, but I certainly would agree that I think a, a, a comprehensive survey of it is overdue. I know there are some graduate students who are working on it. Um, and so I do think that there'll be more coming out about that, especially too, because of the momentous activism of Black women athletes currently, that people will want to give a context for that from the you know sisters in the WNBA to all of the various kinds of you know the tennis stars um, the gymnasts all of these folks I definitely think that there's more to be done there. There's there's there is a skull and I, I was actually trying to find her name I, I don't think the book is out yet and uh, she's African American female scholar that writes on black women in sports. Um, I Amira Rose Davis. Yeah. Thank you. I How was, can I forget? Yes. I was thank feeling bad. I'm like, okay, we gotta we gotta name this sister <laughs> here. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and then also a, a former student of ours from UT Austin, um, who's now a professor at University of Michigan, um, uh, Ava Perkis. Dr. Ava Perkis is doing about black women and, and physical culture, which is sports during like the, the turn of the century, so early 20s, 30s, um, 1920s, 1930s, and she's looking at um, the a really really beautiful history of, of women and, and women that were that were focused on being healthy but wanting to be athletes she has some of the first um, women's basketball teams and basketball leagues um, and that book will be coming out I think I hope I'm well I don't want to I don't I think it's coming out under university press but I don't want to misspeak so um, there are two books that I can think of that are coming out then there's also a number of, as Dr. Gross was saying, there are biographies um, that were written on. There's, there's one that actually Wyoming Atias wrote a book, um, Tiger, I, I forgot the name of it, I think it's Tiger Bells, but Wyoming Atias, who was an Olympian in track and field, there's a number of books uh, about uh, Gail Devers, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, some of the track athletes, um, and um, also gymnasts, stuff about Flojo and other, other gymnasts as well, um, tennis players. So there's, there's a lot more there, and I think that's a wide open field in, uh, in scholarship. And I'm sure we're gonna, as Dr. Gross was saying, I'm sure we're gonna see much more um, scholarship in that area. Thank you. So um, the first question we're gonna allow someone to speak out loud, we're gonna go with uh, Tammy Jackson. And then after Tammy goes, Leah Fulton, I'm gonna come to you. So Tammy, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself too. All right, can y'all hear me? Yes. Oh, hey, Dr. Barry. Hey, Dr. Gross. How y'all doing? Um, so <laughs> I miss y'all too. Uh, what is the two questions? What was the biggest surprise or thing? Because like as a historians and scholars, sometimes like, oh my God, that shocked me or like it, it invigorated you when you were writing this book. What was that? And then Dr. Gross, you actually taught me this in grad school. What was your method of self-care during this writing process? 
Thanks for these questions. Hey, hello, it's good to hear from you. Uh, what shocked me? There's so much. Wow. I think honestly, the more that I learned about Francis Thompson, I was I was surprised um, at at the coverage of her experience. Mm. I was stunned that there were etchings of her that was like this, I was just blown away by that. So that was one piece. And then the other sort of quick piece that always, it's, it wasn't new to me, but I think it's changed over time for me now that I'm a, a, I'm a mother also, is the, the lucid way in which Emmett Till's mother was able to recount his numerous grotesque injuries when she, mm -hmm. when she first recovered his corpse. Okay. Um, that still sort of shakes me to my core. And whenever I watch her do that, I'm always like just brought to tears. So I think those two things are probably what shocked me. In terms of self-care, I mean, sometimes, you know, Dinah and I had to weigh in. We had to just mm -hmm. check in, process, breathe. Sometimes it was just walk away and, you know, Netflix and a red wine and chill. <laughs> you know, and then sometimes, too, I had to just push myself a little bit also that, you know, as hard as it is to study that, like, you know, these sisters lived it you know, sort of try to just summon up some of that energy to keep going. Thanks. Uh, it's good to hear your voice, Tammy. Um, I, I would say for me, um, well, I think we've talked about this before, but it's about the resilience of, of Black mothers. And, um, you know, we talk about um, Emmett Till's mother, but for me, I was thinking about um, Millie and Christine McCoy's mother, Mamma Mia. Um, this is a woman of African descent that gives birth to the first women, uh, African American women uh, conjoined twins. And everything she went through to have those, the, her daughters taken away from her when they were young um, and then sold and then how she went back and she found someone to sponsor her to go to Europe to get them back when they were stolen. Um, having to go to court and go to trial in Britain. I mean, that's just, at that time was amazing. And I knew about the twins. Um, more so from the way in which they were put on display in a very disrespectful way. Um, and it was just different to see it from the perspective of their mother. And so I think that was something that was, um, was shocking and because I just didn't know why that part of the history wasn't told. They were, the spectacle of them was what was told and not so much about the human side of them. Um, and I think um, self-care, that's like, I think everything that Dr. Gross said, um, also exercise, walking, running, whatever, just getting out. Um, also me, I've been doing like mindless television and also comedy, like some comedy just so that I can laugh um, and laugh in the process. And, um, but also like Dr. Gross said at the end, it's like, how can I not make it through whatever X is when these women were going through something a thousand times worse and they did it so we could be here. And so that's where I try to draw strength from them. Thank you both for those responses. Leah, I am going to allow you to ask your question. Make sure you unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really, really rich. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student. Uh, my discipline is in higher ed. Um, I anticipate advancing to candidacy in a couple weeks, and I'm finishing a, a doc minor in Black Studies. Um, my research focuses on Black mothers and um, our relationship to higher education as faculty, as administrators, as students. And part of what I'm spending some time on is related to um, our history, and so laying a foundation for understanding that history, understanding there's also some 
challenges in terms of even how we conceptualize motherhood, thinking about the work of Alexis Pauline Gums. But part of, I guess the question that I'm asking is, um, in the research, in my research so far, um, it is, motherhood is often a cursory mention um, that there's an acknowledgement that um, motherhood played a role in terms of being a mediator for who could or couldn't gain access to higher ed. It's addressed in terms of the kinds of opportunities in terms of work that were had or not allowed to be had. Um, but it's, it's not always um, particularly explicit. And so I appreciate your reflections uh, about motherhood in relationship to Emmett Till and some of the work that you've done. But I'm, I'm curious, um, as we look at these historic issues around education and racial uplift, um, if you've come across any insights related to um, motherhood and accessing higher education. So I, I would start with, with um, I'm going to start with slavery. I know that's not what you're looking for, but I want to start with that time period because um, there was, there, depending on how you define it, there are mothers that that um, were sneaking and teaching, I mean, Heather Williams writes about this in a book called Self-Taught, where mothers were sneaking and teaching their children in the evenings. They had community schools, um, free black women like Susie King Taylor during the Civil War um, were finding ways to teach, um, teach other, the soldiers and also other members of the black community. So I would say that there's, there's always been a drive and a desire um, for parents, for, uh, mothers in particular, for the, to make sure that their children um, learn and get an education beyond whatever they were. Um, so we see that even going back into slavery. Um, and, and, I'm, and for the more contemporary, the more contemporary period, well, I want to say one more thing. Um, we also wrote in this book about mothers who, there, there are some women that, that were, that embraced motherhood and there were other women that did not. And there's some women that left their children behind. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to think about and talk about as well as, as one of the challenges um, of motherhood and, and, and particularly during moments where um, black women were being raped um, and their, how they responded to being mothers. Um, and then there's also women that couldn't be mothers. So that's, there's a lot there, I think. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Gross, did you wanna add anything to that? So unfortunately my um, audio cut out a little bit. So I didn't actually hear the last part of the question. So Leah, I don't know if you're still there Maybe she's gone. No, I can get her back. Oh. I can get a lot of her talk. There you go, Leah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I didn't hear the Thank last you. part. Like you, I know you explained that your research, you were talking about motherhood and education. And then I think you had asked a question um, toward the tail end and, and my audio cut out. Yeah, I was really just asking more specifically if, so I don't have my copy of the book yet. Um, but it's coming. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading. So thank you even for the resources you've just shared, Dr. Barry. But the question that I was really asking is how much you've come across insights in relationship to motherhood and higher education in particular. Um, so these pieces that, um, that Dr. Barry have, has shared, I think are incredibly important and, and insightful. Um, but because I'm not a historian, I've been really eager to to learn from folks who may just have more familiarity with um, resources that I may not. So actually, so I, then I would just echo everything that Dr. Barry shared. Um, the only thing that I, that I might just sort of add is that I definitely encountered a little bit more in terms of when we looked at the role of black girls in desegregating the schools. And so I think there's a lot of, of rich excavation that you can still do around that, particularly with respect to the mothers and the decisions that went into sort of choosing girls. There's a, um, a book, um, uh, is it A Girl Stands at the Door by Rachel Devlin that actually talks about some of this and, and the kind of the, de the decisions that parents and I think mothers especially sort of made in terms of 
picking girls to be sort of on the front line in terms of desegregating schools. Um, and um, I think sometimes the, the immediate response is that we imagine that maybe they would be like safer somehow. But there's a calculation too, is that they are very resourceful um, and able to sort of adapt and, and had like, you know, these qualities that would, you know, enable them to potentially persevere under those circumstances. So. Thank you. Thank you both for um, answering the question and thank you, Leah, for the question. Um, we, we, um, there, there are some, I, I think in some ways, fair and unfair critiques of African American studies or black scholars in academia being disconnected from the reality that, you know, everyday black folk face. Um, I think the book is timely. I think the book is rich. Can you all talk about the significance of the book in terms, because I know y'all mentioned the K through 12 book for, for younger students, but with the policies that have changed in education in Texas and maybe across the country, like how can the book be used to leverage like changes in education K through 12, or maybe even in, in higher education, given that ethnic studies is um, something that's gonna be available to students in Texas and some other states. So yeah, I've been working, um, and we both had, um, as we mentioned earlier about the conference with K through 12 educators over the summer. Um, so Texas, as you just mentioned, is gonna be offering an African-American elective. There are teachers in the Dallas ISD school district who piloted a course uh, about a year ago. Um, there is a teacher, um, Ms. Kina Cook, who's out of uh, Kyleen ISD, who's teaching the course now. Um, and I think um, there are other black women scholars that have taught uh, and worked with um, like leadership training and, and uh, what is it called? Uh, professional development workshops for K through 12 educators like Kelly Carter Jackson, um, where they're teaching workshops with teachers on how to teach history. Um, so I think that this book, um, and we, we learned, and we were pleasantly surprised. Um, we didn't know that that would be the outcome, but this book was something that has been really embraced by, the, by a number of high school, um, middle school teachers. And we were floored when we were at this conference and had this really dynamic conversation with a number of, of educators um, and how they wanted to use it in the classroom. So I'm optimistic about the direction. Um, I think also because of the change in administration in, that's coming in the next week or so, um, also with Betsy DeVos um, stepping down, um, that's gonna change the way we think about, um, I think that's gonna open up the door for more ethnic studies at the K through 12 level. We also have um, Mex a Mexican um, ethnic studies, Mexican American uh, studies being taught at, uh, in Texas public schools, but a number of other school systems are, are, being, are involved in this as well. So I think, I think it's the, the door is wide open and I hope that we can drive forward and help with that and so in, any, in any way that we can. Thank you. Um, want to thank you all for your time. Um, we're going to segue into, unless Dr. Gross, did you have something you want to add? Okay. I was going to say, no, I, I just, I totally agree with Diana. And I, I hope that we get it into the schools more. I mean, we both do work with, with teacher trainings and trying to um, help in terms of just making it available and as a resource. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Uh, we're going to segue into uh, talking about um, some future events for entrepreneurial appetite. Want to ask one final question, though. There are numerous questions in the chat that we just won't have time to get to. So what is the best way for people in the audience to ask questions about uh, when the reader is coming out for K through 12 students, more about the process for how you all uh, develop the book and, and, and just the process in general, how can they get in contact with you and maybe get some of their questions answered or where can they go to get some more information? So we both have our own personal websites and there's a contact page on both of our websites and um, the, our websites just have our name. You can just Google them or put our name in. Um, we're both on uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, even though I'm still learning how to use mine. 
Um, but we, so that's one way to, to contact us. Um, and I think you put some, send something through the contact and we'll also have updates on speaking engagements. We'll have, well, I'm sure we'll both be po posting when the um, paperback is coming out pretty soon. Um, so that'll be, um, that'll be out, I think. Uh, actually, I don't remember when the release date for the paperback, but it's coming out in the next month, right? I think it is. Do you know, Dr. Gross? I believe so. I think it'll be out next month. In, uh, yes. I think it'll be out in time for Black History Month. I believe that's what, that makes the most sense. So I'm going to go, I'm going with that, friends. All right. Yeah. And I agree, the contact page is, is probably the best way. Thank you, Tammy, for adding that in the chat. So you all should be able to yeah. see that. So, uh, yes. Their websites. Thank you. They're both there. Uh -huh. yeah. Ladies, thank you both for coming. Uh, thank you for writing the book. Um, as I said, those of you who are in the audience, stick around because I'm going to talk about some of our future events. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions, but like I said, you all can um, definitely find more information about uh, Dr. Barry and Dr. Gross via their websites. And I am going to show myself now. Thank you for having us. Thank oh, you yes, so thank much. You. Thanks yes, so much for having you us. Coming. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Sure. Good night. So before you all go, everyone else, just want to share next month's events. And so as a, another part of Dream Week, we're going to be having a conversation about uh, financial technology and how it can be used to leverage economic liberation in Black communities. And so we have the QR code there if you all want to register for that. I'll also be sending a follow-up um, follow Eventbrite for you all to register. Uh, that is also a donation as well. And we're going to be uh, making using those donations to support scholarships at North Carolina a and um, Calvin Williams was actually SGA president when I was there my sophomore year in school. So we want to uh, definitely support that. And again, that is also part of Dream Week. And then uh, early in February, we are partnering with the Atlanta chapter of the North Carolina a and State University Aggie Pride um, alumni chapter. And we're gonna have a conversation with Dr. Jelani Favors, who is the author of Shelter in the Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Foster Generations of Leadership and Activism. And we are just inviting anybody to join that conversation and uh, hear more about the history of black colleges. And, um, Looking forward to some fruitful discussions moving forward here for Dream Week, but also as we begin Black History Month. Thank you all for joining. I appreciate you. I appreciate the donations and um, you all stay safe and uh, have a good and fruitful rest of your weekend. Thank you. So uh, Sharice, you was my security blanket this week. Just letting you know. Thank, thank you for being.